Good morning. I want to welcome you to Gardening in the Mountains, Turf, Truth, and Transformation. My name is Allison Arnold. I'm the Agriculture Extension Agent here in Buncombe County for the Cooperative Extension Service. I will be your host and your presenter today. John Boland is our Extension Master Gardener who will be hosting and watching the chat box. He has put the link to our handout in the chat box as well, making that available, which has a number of resources on it that I'll be talking about today or referencing or not. So good morning. We are talking today about several things about turf. What is the truth about turf? What does it take to have turf? What are the issues around growing turf grass and lawns? And then how can we transform our turf and lawns? So those are the three areas that I'll be covering this morning in our talk. It's a very complex situation. Everyone is different. I won't be going into the history of lawns. I think everyone understands how that all came to be and the pressures that some of us may be under in neighborhoods and HOAs to maintain the perfect lawn. We'll be touching on that a little bit, but I just wanted to clarify that it is a complex issue. It's very personal. There's a lot of marketing around it, and there's a lot of different information out there about it, even within North Carolina State University. I'll be touching on some of that as well, but we'll be going over a lot of the basic recommendations on how to maintain good turf. So what is true about turf? What do we know about turf and lawns and that open space that we love that has a function and a purpose? We know that it's for recreation. There are some uses where we play. It's a, a way of setting off the garden. There's just a lot of things that we know are very functional and purposeful about lawns and turf. So what do grasses do? We know that grasses have a very important function besides just play and access. It traps dust and dirt, reduces noise, absorbs heat and reduces surface temperature much more than just straight asphalt and pavement, reduces glare, certainly reduces surface runoff, provides a place to play, sets off the garden, which all gardeners know that's an important piece as well. And it definitely controls erosion. It stabilizes soil and can be a good starting point post-construction. It does filter water which is a very important part where we get to surface runoff and it generates a lot of oxygen. It is a growing plant and it does provide that for our living beings, humans, animals alike. Now, what does it not do for us? Well, it doesn't provide a lot of habitat for wildlife grown in a monoculture especially, doesn't provide food nectar or larval hosting for our pollinators. There's no real seasonal interest unless it turns brown due to dormancy or the type of variety that you might be growing. There's really no fragrance or tactile other than the nice smooth carpet that turf can provide. There's no sensory value that's provided by grass and it does not add diversity. So at least in the sense that we're talking about today, initially in this part of the talk, where we're really talking about a monoculture of a crop, of a grass. So what's amazing about grass is that it's evolved and it's built to graze and mow. So grass has evolved, you know, from the prairies where they were grazed constantly and they have this meristem, which is the growing point at the base of the plant and at different places up along the plant, it allows us to graze it and mow it and it keeps growing. And then it also sends out these underground or overground stolons or rhizome and continues to grow. This growing point is what is critical for grass to do what it does very much different than 
the dicots or our different other flowering plants where you've got growing points at the tips and at the axillary buds and maybe some crown buds, but not normally and certainly not like grasses do. This is how they could tolerate being mowed regularly because of this important growing point. And so they're amazing in that way. And other plants, they just don't do what grasses can. They don't tolerate the wear and you just don't get that wearable, tolerant cover that grass provides. Even though we might want to put in our native ground covers and native grasses, it's just not the same. And so there's really nothing that compares to the aesthetics of a dense green carpet of grass. We have become accustomed to that and we have come used to having that and it's marketed to us. So many of us strive for that and there's really no replacement. What we'll be talking about today is what does it take to maintain this? What's the impact of maintaining this type of turf surface in our landscapes? And then what are some ways that we can change our practices and our perspectives to make some adjustments so that we can begin living more sustainable in our landscapes and in our world? So again, turf, they're unusual. There's like 10,000 grass species worldwide. 50 of those adapted to use as turf. And in North Carolina, we have basically seven lawn species that are common, but no single species is adapted to all areas of the state. As you can imagine, North Carolina, Murphy to Manio, we've got the mountains, the Piedmonts and the coastal areas. We've got over a hundred native species of grasses that we all love and we grow as ornamentals in our gardens. But again, none of these are mown or adapted to be mown as turf because of their large clumping habits. Now I haven't spoken to and don't really get into buffalo grass, but sometimes that does come up because people are interested in buffalo grasses. And that is a prairie warm season perennial. If you look for it on the internet, they do talk about it being grown in zones three to nine, and we are zone seven, six to seven, depending on your elevation, you could even be in a five. And I, according to NC State, it's not grown widely throughout the state, but I am interested in hearing from people who have worked with buffalo grass here in Western North Carolina or the Southeastern region and in a climate similar to us here in the mountains and what level of success you're having. That's one thing we have talked about working with as far as native grasses, but again, it's a much different aesthetic than what we're talking about with many of our turf type grasses. So in North Carolina and throughout the U S we have two types of grasses that we typically grow cool season turf, which you can see in this top image, the active growth is when it's cool in the spring, late winter, early spring into maybe early summer, depending on your elevation. And then again in the fall. And this is also when we get our root growth. And as you can see in the, in this diagram in the summer, it slows down when we get high heat and maybe even some dry periods, our cool season grasses will slow down and maybe even go into dormancy, depending on the weather and the amount of rainfall we get. Cool season turf grasses that we typically grow are tall fescue, fine fescues, Kentucky bluegrass. Fine fescues also includes the creeping reds and the hard fescues. So these are the fine bladed grasses that are also part of these cool season turf. Then in the bottom diagram, you'll see the warm season turf grass, which is basically warm season. They grow during the summer. They start growing late spring and into early fall. And that is their period of growth. During the winter, they go dormant. They turn brown. The zoysia and Bermuda are mainly grown through North Carolina, but you'll also see centipede and St. Augustine. Now. 
in the Piedmont area of North Carolina, you can grow a little bit of both depending on your exposure. In Western North Carolina, you'll see Bermuda. That's grown very commonly in golf courses. Bermuda can be a bad weed in many of our perennial gardens as well. But it's important for you to see that our main cool season turf grasses are what we recommend for Western North Carolina. And so a lot of our care and maintenance is based around those cool seasons. And we'll talk about more of that. Again, cool season grasses, we're talking about Kentucky bluegrass, tall fescue, these spread by rhizomes. If you remember the image I showed earlier, these are underground stems that spread out and they will recover damaged spots and fill in open spots. They're very good at recovery and filling in in that way, given good soil conditions and site conditions. Perennial ryegrass and the fine fescues, they're more of a clumping or bunching grass. They don't spread or fill in. And so it's a different aesthetic and you can often see this when there might be mixed or when you might have different things going on in your lawn. Now I will say that identifying grasses is a real challenge. As you can imagine here at our office in extension, we like to have seed heads. We like for it to go to bloom or to seed to really identify grasses because there are very, very minute particular characteristics of grass that help differentiate the different types. And so it can be challenging, but it can be done, but it's an art and it's a science. And when you're used to identifying trees and shrubs, bringing it down to the grass level can be really challenging. But for the main part, when we talk about fine fescues, the blade is much thinner. And of course the tall fescue, the blade is broader. I just wanted to help you understand that. So what are the maintenance issues? What does it take to maintain the lawns that we're used to? Mowing, of course, is high on the list. The recommendation is to maintain two and a half to three and a half inches. And actually the higher, the better, especially when it's warm season and it's not as active or as dormant, we can go to the lower end of that during cool season when it's actively growing. People are very curious about this. I encourage you to take your ruler out and measure because a lot of mowers really don't go very high. They might not go three and a half. They definitely don't go four inches. But, you know, we're talking about a high mowing height on your mowing deck or your mower. Maintaining that high point is really important. We typically need to mow weekly or as needed to maintain that optimal height. And again, as the warmer weather comes on and the higher temperatures and the grass slows down, we can back off of that. We might not need to go weekly. We have to keep in mind, this is a growing plant that has a growing stem. And if we cut into that, we really stress it. So this is why we encourage the high mowing height to allow the grass to really grow at its best. Important to keep the mower blade sharp. If you think about pruning a shrub, you wanna have good sharp pruners so you have a good clean cut. This allows it to heal, but also prevents diseases for entering those rough cuts. It also makes your mower more effective and more efficient. And that's a really important thing too. We want to allow the clippings to fall back into the turf and not bag them. Of course, if you're having a disease issue or you've had to skip a couple of mow cycles because of the weather, if it's been wet and you get large clumps, then you can certainly remove those compost them, use them for mulch. We don't need to be adding clippings to the landfill. If we allow the clippings to fall, we can help the grass in the long run by adding nutrients back in. And of course, we don't want to mow when it's wet because not only does that help spread diseases, it also bogs down the mower and adds to a lot of other issues with the soil, like soil compaction. Believe it or not, we don't go into the garden when it's wet because we want to maintain good soil structure. It's the same way with the lawns. Watering is really important only when we see signs of stress. And this is when turf may be 
turning blue or gray, you might leave a footprint on it and it doesn't come back. It doesn't bounce back and the footprint stays. You actually see wilting or curling of leaves. These are all signs of water stress in an established lawn. We want to check automatic systems and we need to adjust for rainfall. There are many smart irrigation watering systems now that will work with rainfall and measure that. But we also have to stay on top and make sure that those are calibrated and adjusted on a regular basis. So checking systems for timing, when they come on, how long they're on, when they shut off, the coverage, are your heads overlapping? Are you getting a good coverage? And then is it taking into account the rainfall that's coming? I'm sure all of you have driven by an automatic system where you're driving through a rain and there's the system spraying water out on the lawn. So that's where it needs to be checked. We don't need to be watering when it's raining. We want to reduce disease development. So watering early in the day is important to allow the turf to dry off. Just like the garden, especially if you're a tomato grower, you know about this that we want for the grass to dry off before our cool evenings settle in where disease development during the summer can be prevalent. When we do water, we want to water deep down into a six to eight inch profile if possible so that we can promote that deep root growth. The deeper the roots, the more resilient the, the grass will be going into dry periods to recovering after a drought situation. So again, systems need to be able to accommodate for that. And of course the soil drainage, and we'll get into that in a minute. I want to parallel your thinking with the lawn, with our garden, because we spend a lot of time talking about soil conditioning and soil drainage in the vegetable garden because we want that water to go down deep into that root system. It's the same with turf. It's a growing plant and that deep root system will help it once it's established, really be resilient and grow well. One other thing about watering is allowing a cool season turf to go dormant in the summer. If you'll remember back about the growth chart in the summer months, as it warms up, we can also dry out a little bit, but the heat will also cause that cool season turf to slow down. If we are watering, we are encouraging growth and not allowing it to go dormant. And so we can save a considerable amount of water and maintenance by backing off on the watering, allowing natural rainfall, watching for those signs of stress. And if we do go into a dry period or a drought, a certified drought, then we can go in and monitor it and maybe do one or two deep waterings just to keep it going, but not keep it thriving and actively growing. It's not a new concept, but it's one that we typically don't really think about because we think grass is growing, we're going to water it, we're going to mow it, but it has a natural cycle. And if we work with that, it can do really well and it can save a lot of input into the environment, can save a lot of resources and time and energy that we typically put into the lawn. So use a rain gauge or a smart watering system. In fact, a lot of recommendations you'll hear, and this is across the board, one inch of water per week per thousand square feet of area. Well, how do you measure that? You get a rain gauge, but it's 640 gallons of water is needed to apply that one inch. That's a lot of water that we're putting out onto the lawn that we could back off of and allow the lawn to go through its natural cycles and do quite well. All right, let's talk about soil compaction, okay? Because turf is not adapted to a compacted soil and soil gets compacted over time by lawnmowers, 
construction equipment, foot traffic, and even rain, just the impact of rain falling on our clay soils over time does compact it. And we don't really think about that. So when we think about plants growing and roots penetrating into soil, we need to help with that. Oftentimes using a screwdriver test, you could get a screwdriver or something and probe into moderately moist soil, of course, and see how far you can get down. You know, try the shovel test. Can you really dig in and think about what needs to happen to make the soil profile more friable so that the roots can penetrate down? Soil compaction is one that we definitely overlook. It happens over time. It can be in a new home construction because we have run every type of equipment and truck and vehicle over the area. We've put the house in, we've put in our mulch, we've put in some grass seed to stabilize the soil and it's compacted and it's heavy clay. So we have to work with that. There are different ways of managing that compaction. One of the ways that we do that is to aerate the turf. This is a process of going in and pulling plugs. We recommend these hollow tine aerators where you're pulling out plugs of turf and soil. You want to do this when the grass is actively growing. So you get quick recovery. You break up these plugs and then you can overseed right into there. So fall is an ideal time for aerating and overseeding. This allows water and oxygen to get down into the soil. Some people will also apply organic matter, could be compost, soil conditioner, just like you would in a perennial bed to improve your soil drainage, to increase the organic matter in the soil profile. So aeration is a really important process, not so much annually, but at least initially when you are seeing that you are having some compaction issues. You have a question about the probe for determining if your lawn is compact. How deep should you be able to insert the screwdriver before you conclude that you are or are not compacted? What are the mechanics there? Okay, that's a great question because screwdrivers, you want a longer one. You're just trying to get a sense of how easy it is to penetrate the soil. If you have to really put pressure on it, even at just a couple of inches, it's compacted. Grass typically grows in most normal soils. If it's a very well-drained soil, six to eight inches. More than likely in most of our lawns, it's four to six inches. That's usually where we want those roots to go. I mean, we're talking ideal, right? So if you're not able to penetrate a four inch profile, or you have a hard time putting pressure on that in order it to insert your probe, then it's compacted. We don't need it like you're planting a vegetable garden. We don't need it to be friable that you're getting your hands into it, but you want to be able to insert your probe at least to a four inch depth. Good. Thank you. If you do decide to aerate, then based on your work with the probe, you mentioned several times aerating in the fall. Is it also viable or a good idea to aerate in the spring? Sure. Again, when the grass is actively growing, so you would want to try and shoot for that in early March. Again, because, you know, you could predict the weather. We've had a cool April and so grasses will have continued to grow, but we're moving towards May, which will warm up and the grasses will slow down. So you can aerate late winter, early spring, when the grasses really start growing. So it's fine to do it then. I just want us to help shift our focus to that fall season for getting a lot of our turf work accomplished. Okay, thank you very much. I think it would be a good time to move on to the next part of this presentation. The next point is on fertility and fertilizing. The ideal pH for turf is 6.0 to 6.5. Our native soils are typically 4.5 to 5.5, which is why we grow rhododendrons and azaleas and sourwoods and mountain laurels and blueberries so well. 
because they really prefer that pH, but our turf grass varieties do best at a higher pH. So soil testing every two to three years for a pH level and for phosphorus and potassium levels to help us make sure we get those basic nutrients and the soil pH in place to help promote good turf growth. Now, nitrogen is not measured in the soil testing that we do through the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Typically when people call us or come to us with problems about their turf, soil testing is always the first question we ask because we want to make sure that that pH is at a good place and your phosphorus is at a good place. Our soils typically are low in phosphorus and phosphorus is good for root growth. And so we want to make sure those are at an appropriate level. As I said, we don't measure nitrogen. It's ephemeral in the soil. It doesn't stay. It's not something that we can measure quite readily. And so the typical recommendation is a total of three pounds of actual nitrogen annually per thousand square feet. But these are applied in three different periods, one pound each in September, November, and then February. Now, remember, go back to the cool season growth pattern. Remember when I showed that the active time for cool season grasses is in the fall and through the winter, early spring. So we're taking advantage of those growth times to apply nitrogen. If that is what you feel like you need to get your grass to grow grass definitely responds to nitrogen, but applying it when it's actively growing and will utilize it is what's important. Now, more recent recommendations, they are backing off on the amounts to two pounds total, where you apply one pound in September or in the fall when it's actively growing, and then cutting back to a half a pound in November and February. So that's something to consider. Now, in March and August, you'll see in some of our recommendations that you can apply a fifth to a half a pound of nitrogen just to green up or help a turf recover. We don't recommend applying fertilizer past mid-March because it does lead to early summer diseases. Remember in March, well, definitely in April and May, the turf is starting to slow down. The temperatures are warming. The turf cycle starting to slow down. And if we want to allow that turf to go into its normal dormancy or slowing down process, we don't want to jazz it up by adding fertilizer. So there's a cross purpose that happens there. When we look at all the marketing and we look at the commercials, those companies usually don't start promoting until April or May when we've already gone through our turf season and all we are going into is maintenance. So I, I hope that is clear that we want to focus fertility of maintaining good pH. And in the fall, when you're aerating, overseeding, this is a great time to get your lime in and to put your fertilizer out. Again, when it's actively growing, you'll get good recovery and we can have a warmish to cool fall and turf will grow well into December. And usually come January or February, when we get into the heart of our winter, it does slow down a little bit, but then it peaks back up again. And then by mid-March, we really want to be done with all our work as much as possible. Again, following the cycle of growth. What about the weeds? We can't forget the weeds because we know that this is part of maintaining our monoculture. In the literature and in our education, we really emphasize maintaining a healthy and dense lawn to keep out the weeds. Basically, if there's no place for a weed to take root, it won't. And I say that in quotes you know, because there's no guarantees when it comes to weeds, it comes to your site and how established your lawn is and what you've done, the history of your lawn. But we do want to emphasize that the best defense against weeds is maintaining that proper mowing height, 
maintaining a high height, fertilizing correctly at the rates that are given and the times when watering deep to establish deep roots. So again, when people call and say they've got weed problems in their lawns, we typically ask, what's your soil pH? Are you dealing with soil compaction? Because if you go out today, and I encourage everybody to go out to your lawn this afternoon, depending on where you are in the perfect lawn spectrum, and just really look at where your problem areas are. If you're having problems with crabgrass or goosegrass or some of the annual summer grasses that pop up where the soil is bare, then more than likely you're dealing with compacted soils. Again, get your screwdriver out, get your soil probe or your trowel and see if you can penetrate. Because if you throw grass seed over that and it's compacted, nothing's gonna grow there except crabgrass. As we know, weeds are opportunistic and they'll take advantage of different sites for the different conditions and take root. So those summer annuals will definitely come into bare soil. And again, when people call and their first question is, what do I put down? You can put down a herbicide all day long, which hopefully you're not, but even at the correct times. But if you have not corrected those cultural issues, it's really not gonna help you in the long run. Your weeds are just gonna continue to grow. Now in your reference sheet, there is a link to our Extension Gardener Handbook. Chapter nine is on lawns. And if you dig into that, there's a nice chart there that has weed indicators for different site conditions. So if you're interested in identifying what the weed is, which is also maybe not our first question, but our second question, surely high on the list is what is the weed you're dealing with? And maybe what is it showing you about the site condition? It could be it's compacted. It could be that it's wet. It could be a number of things. So that's an interesting thing to look at if you're dealing with one prevalent type of weed. We don't want to forget about the weeds because we know that this is one of the things that we deal with most. Okay, John, are there any questions that you feel like this would be a good time to answer? We have a very specific question about dealing with Japanese stilt grass. Can you help us out with that? <laughs> wow, that's a tough one because traditionally we've seen Japanese stilt grass come into lawns that are in shade. Japanese stilt grass prefers moist shade. It is a terrible pernicious weed. It's a annual weed with a seed viability of five years or more, but we are seeing it come into full sun situations as well. And our main recommendation is keep it from going to seed and do everything that we've been talking about to try and outcompete it. If we're talking about stilt grass in the lawn, that's a real tough one. We are seeing some progress, non-chemical progress by mowing, hand pulling, mulching, but oh my gosh, it's an issue and something everyone has to deal with. So I, I don't know if that helps, but just to let you know you're not alone. And that seems to be a real issue that a lot of people are dealing with. Thank you for that. I know it's an issue that I'm dealing with. Another question here that's peripherally related to weeds. How could we get rid of bowls, bowls, and grubs in a way that's safe for the lawn, pets, and people? That's good. So again, I'm going to reference everyone to the Extension Gardener Handbook. There's a good chapter there on wildlife management, and it goes into more detail about moles and voles because it's important for us to understand exactly what we're talking about. And moles and voles are different. We often put them together, but we need to understand which one we're dealing with. Moles with an M are carnivorous. They are going after soil insects like earthworms and grubs and soil insects. They love it when the soil is moist. So when we are in an abundant rain period, we often see them more active. 
they will go into an area and they are quite troublesome because they can loosen the soil and make it dangerous to walk on. There are a lot of strategies for running them out or letting them just run their course, identifying moles and doing prevention strategies is important. If they are going after grubs and you are dealing with a grub situation, then you really need to identify if that is true. Are we talking about what kind of grub? Japanese beetle grubs, green June beetle grubs, brown beetle grubs. There's a lot of different grubs out there. I will speak to Japanese beetles because they hatch and fly in June and they will lay their eggs back into typically thin or poorly established turf. So a good management strategy against grubs, which then can help reduce moles, is to keep and maintain a thick cover of turf on your lawn area. During that time, back off mowing so that the turf stays long. Make sure that you do all the cultural information we talked about to maintain good dense cover so that the beetles don't have a place to come back in and lay their eggs. You notice that beetles don't really lay eggs into mulch. They are really looking for soil contact. So they'll go where there's bare soil. So consider that voles are vegetarians. They're going after your plants. They typically will use the tunnels and access ways that moles create. If you're starting to see plants die back, hustas disappear, or the roots being eaten and the plants wilting, or the base of shrubs being gnawed on, then you definitely have a vole problem and you definitely need to work on getting rid of those and protecting your plants. So you do have to identify what you have and then follow some strategies in that way. Unfortunately, there's no magic bullet, but understanding and being educated and learning about what you're really dealing with is the first step. Okay, thank you very much. I think it would be a good time to move on to the next part of this presentation. We got to talk about the environmental issues now, and I want to thank you for your questions about the insects and the animals, because they are real. <laughs> we do deal with those, but we've talked about the maintenance issues and what it takes to maintain a dense, healthy lawn. And I do want to say that healthy is sort of in the eye of the beholder, but you may have an idea that if we're going along that line, the density, the good cultural conditions or what's important. And we can do a lot of that, our fertility, our aeration, managing our water without really impacting the environment as much as we think. But I, I wanna just take a moment for us to look at what the environmental issues are and the impacts of what we do on lawn. Something about 40 million acres of land in the continental US has some form of lawn on it, some form of grass. We spend over $30 billion a year on lawn care every year, either through purchase of products or services. I'm not even talking about the golf course industry. I'm just kind of stating the fact of where we are with the amount of land that we have in lawn and the amount of money we spend on it. Data and statistics are super hard to track down. A lot of it depends on the provider of those data details. EPA has done regular statistics, but I've not been able to find anything recently other than the early 2000s. So much has been changing in the industry and we have seen a lot of changes and people being more aware and making some adjustments. But I wanted to report this study I just read recently in Consumer Report where they surveyed probably their members, 1,772 lawn owners, about their lawn practices. And 51% of those responded that they only mow, that they don't use pesticides or fertilizers, which I thought was really an interesting number. Now, again, these are consumer report members, probably. They didn't clarify that, but I'm assuming that. 
and 51% said they mowed only and did not apply pesticides or fertilizers. Yet how many of us really strive for that perfect lawn? And that's something when I think about the advertisements, I know that that's who they're marketing towards, but it's just a really interesting piece that I've been curious about. And again, this is home lawn owners. The data and the statistics are very complex. It's a very complex issue and it's hard to track down because we're all doing this in our home. It's a hard thing to do, but I wanted to track a few numbers for you. We always have to have a few numbers about water. So there are statistics out there, some of them variable, but reaching back to some early EPA records that 30 to 60%, it's a good range of urban fresh water is used on lawns. And about three quarters of our residential use on average is used outside of the house. So in gardens and lawns, this isn't showering and household use. This is outside. So a good bit of fresh water is used for maintaining our lawns and gardens. Fuel, fuel and emissions is a huge amount that we provide through just maintaining. 800 million gallons of gas use annually. A side number that 17 millions of this is spilled in the process of using gas, which is an interesting thing about just checking your gas tanks and your gas cans. Are they up to date and are they effective? And that through the mowing, weed eating and blowing and all the different equipment that we use, that the emissions comprise 5% of the nation's air pollution. So there's a lot of emissions that are going out by our two and four cycle engines, by the different equipment that we're using and the fuel that we are requiring to run those equipment. So fertilizer, much higher in urban garden use than agriculture use, 3 million tons a year of nitrogen based fertilizers are produced for every ton of fertilizer that is produced, this adds four to five tons of carbon to the atmosphere, just in manufacturing process. Now soil microbes do turn nitrogen into uh, use for the plants, but also additional nitrogen goes out as nitrous oxide gas, which is a serious greenhouse gas. So when we over fertilize with nitrogen, that can go back out into the atmosphere. And then 40 to 60% of nitrogen that we apply ends up in service or groundwater. This is an important number for us to keep in our thinking, you know, because when we apply it to the surface, it doesn't all go to the plants as they need it. A lot of it is carried off into the surface and groundwater and waterways. And then of course there's pesticides, 78 million U.S. households use some form of home and garden pesticides, 90 million pounds are applied in lawns and gardens per year. Again, these numbers are difficult to track, but it just gives you an idea of the enormity of the input and the resources that we put into the gardens and to our turf lawns to help keep those maintained. So one piece about turf grass and climate change, because as you could tell, this is all leading in that direction as far as environmental impact. We are clear now, and we have a great North Carolina climate office here working for us and providing information. They are letting us know, and this is throughout the continental US, but here in our area, climate change patterns, we are typically going to see an increase in temperature and precipitation patterns. Our rainfall patterns are increasing in extremes in regards to extreme weather events and extreme fluctuations. So we will be experiencing periods of dry and periods of heavy wet and extreme periods of temperature swings from cold to hot 
but with a more normal trend towards warming. So we are looking forward to seeing a longer growing season, for instance. And my gosh, probably just in the last couple of years, but even in the last couple of months, we've seen that. We've seen these swings and we've seen these changes in rainfall. So some of the outcomes of this, and this was out of a Journal of Agronomy study, that they found there'll be a northward migration of the warm season types of grasses. Like we're seeing more shrubs and trees that are more of the Piedmont and coastal region and of warmer zones moving and being more winter hardy for us. So those warm season grasses will be seeing more of those be cold hardy for us in our region. They see an increased potential for abiotic and biotic stresses. Now, abiotic, those are stresses that are environmental, human caused, and biotic are diseases and in insects that are living causes of stresses. So there'll be more issues related to turf, more stresses based on these fluctuations and heavy rainfalls. And yet there's an increased opportunity to select turf that is good for climate resilience, that's able to handle these shifts and to handle these stresses. And so we want to be more attentive to the type of turf that we are selecting. And in fact, the North Carolina Department of Horticulture and their turf grass specialists are doing a lot of trials to look at better turf types that can help tolerate drought that can tolerate site conditions of compaction, that can tolerate better excessive water situations, heat, things like that. So turf selection is an important thing, just as we select our perennials and trees and shrubs to handle the conditions that are local to our area. So again, increased rainfall events will also increase the runoff into rivers and waterways. So really be attentive if you are applying fertilizers that you want to apply it not right before a heavy rain. And they are, believe it or not, getting better at predicting when we get these heavy rainfall events. So you want to make sure that you sweep off your walkways and your driveways, any hard surface, get it back onto the lawn and try and decrease or reduce the chance of runoff if possible. Now, I want to touch on just the aesthetic issues because it feels like it's the elephant in the room. And who can resist? If you're playing golf, if you're setting off your garden, you know, it's something that we have come to know and love. You know, it's a fact that we have to be really honest about. And in fact, I want to let you know, I did a short survey of some master gardeners here in Buncombe County wanting to know how are lawns managed or regulated in HOAs and developments. Homeowners associations within developments often have requirements and guidelines about planting, what you can plant, where you can plant it. And I'm curious about the lawns because I often wonder where the pressure is coming from for us to maintain these. Is it just a personal aesthetic? Now, granted, I want to accept that, that how can we resist this? And yet how much of this is driven by personal peer pressure? It goes way back, you know, who wants to put a vegetable garden in their front yard? Well, if you're in a small neighborhood and everybody's got a well-kept lawn and you start growing corn, well, that's going to stand out. But as we start growing our own food, or that may be the only sunny space to grow corn, then that's what we do. So I think we're loosening up a lot about giving ourselves permission to adjust and make some changes in that way. But I, I just want to acknowledge that there may be some requirements in some areas and policy changes that we could work on or just consider having those conversations together so that we don't stand out if we're going to start making some changes to our practices, which you can see where this talk is headed. 
But all of that aside, we're not a golf course and we may not have the resources to put all the inputs into making it look like this and that we're looking at here. Sometimes it just looks bad, you know, between mowing too short, too often, or we scalp it. I really encourage you to look around at how lawns are maintained because typically we are on a regular mowing regime, whether it needs it or not. And so we're mowing once a week. And if it's not growing, if it's slowing down, then we have to get that good sharp cut and we're scalping the soil. We're scalping it and we're causing a lot of stress. And so we get these open bare spots. We're fertilizing too much or at the wrong time. Again, now April and May is not the time to be pumping out a lot of fertilizer because it's going to start slowing down. We've got shade and tree where watering too much or not enough. We've got soil compaction. We're dealing with slopes. We've got weeds and diseases and insects and animals. And there's us and all the equipment we're on. So it's a lot that we're fighting and it's not that we're fighting. It's just that we're up against a lot of issues there. So it can just look bad. And you can tell this is a playground. There's a slide just peeking in there to the side. Slide, playgrounds, dog pens. These are all really challenging areas. And so to summarize for turf. They're high maintenance. They require a lot of impact, input, and resources to maintain. We have a lot of environmental impact to reach that. And with our best efforts, it can still look bad. We still have somebody coming in and digging out their winter knots. We've got moles coming in and, oh my gosh, we've just got a lot to deal with. So I want to move into the last part of our talk about transforming turf. I know we're going over and I apologize for that, but as you can tell, this is a complex issue and we've had some really good questions. So I hope you can hang on. So what are the ways to transform turf? What are some ways that we can look at changing the turf that we've been working to maintain? and giving ourselves permission to transform it into less impact and better for the environment. So we can design to reduce the maintenance. We can start by minimizing turf to certain areas, by designing maintenance, eliminate turf in heavy shade, mulching trees and planting ground covers, planting steep slopes, eliminating those hard to maintain areas like those sharp corners where we have to mow into 90 degree angles or small pockets or areas that we have to string trim around fence posts and mailboxes. And of course we can edge around the beds or put hardscape material down on paths and high traffic areas. These are ways that we can eliminate the maintenance around turf. We can also eliminate problem areas. Areas like this that are not for recreation or needed for accessibility. These can stabilize the soil, but the long term of this can be transformed into another type of planting. Where sites are wet, shady, or difficult to maintain. We can just get rid of that turf and, and transform it. We can make changes in the maintenance and how we maintain our lawns. This is a really important piece. We can reduce and eliminate fertilizing established lawns. If your lawn is well established, you can back off and maybe even eliminate regular fertilization regimes. You can allow turf to go dormant during the summer. Again, remember cool season grasses slow down as it warms up. So we can allow that turf to slow down, go through its normal life cycle and go dormant and back off of mowing. We can allow more weeds to come in to the garden, into the lawn. We can mow less often, cut back on our frequency, and we can use battery powered mowers. 
and not collect our clippings. This has been advertised and promoted for a really long time. Mulching mowers are out there. Do not bag the clippings. Do not put them into the landfill. Actually, those clippings decompose and they add nitrogen and can reduce your nitrogen needs. So if you're backing off on your fertilizer, allowing the clippings to drop, that can be good for overall grass health. If we mow less often, this can increase the abundance and the availability for flowers also reduces the need for water because as you mow, there's more water resources in order to the grass will respond to the mowing and start growing again. So if you mow less often, it will not need that water. It will also help the lawns be more resilient to dry periods. Remember the deep roots mowing less often also reduces the emissions from our gas powered equipment. So just backing off mowing can help a lot and fertilizing and weed control. What about the weeds? If we allow more weeds, we can just live and let live, right? This is a picture I took at my house just yesterday afternoon to show you there's plantain and wild violets and dandelions and chickweed coming in. So we can allow more weeds just naturally to come in or we can create a bee lawn. There's information more and more out there, Xerxes Society, Bee City USA, and how to actively create bee lawns. We can overseed an existing lawn with bee lawn mixes in the spring or fall. Some of these seed mixes are a blend of fine fescues. These are the fine bladed fescues a Dutch white or micro clover and additional plants like self heal or creeping thyme. There's different mixes that are available for that. If you do this, you want to mow high and less often so that you can allow the flowers to grow and actually flower for the pollinators. We can postpone mowing a little bit. As you can see, I've done that here to allow bees to forage into these plants. And then we can also back off on our fertilizer and watering. Just focus when you're establishing a bee lawn or a lawn that you'll be watering and fertilizing to get that establishment. But once it's established, you can back off and let it go through its cycle. In fact, too much nitrogen and water will promote the growth of grass. And so you want a little balance there and backing off that will help a lot. All right, so be lawns and allow more weeds, live and let live. And weeds, right? So we wanna tolerate most of them. We can hand pull or spot treat the problematic ones. Those might be bittersweet or wineberry or some woody plants that come in that we want to try and keep back. Don't use any weed and feed products because of the pollinators and the wildlife that we're wanting to encourage. Just briefly, you'll see some mixes out there. Clover can be added to the lawn. You'll see micro clovers. These are clovers as a low growing perennial legume, which can also reduce the nitrogen fertilizer recommendation. You can see in the bottom image, the regular clover is larger leaf versus the micro clover or mini clover. These micro clovers have been coming out to be put into a turf because they're smaller in stature, lower growing, less vigorous. They have fewer flowers, but they can be used to blend in with the turf. They do have some disadvantages. They're not shade tolerant or drought tolerant, and they're not really strong for wear tolerance. So just some things to think about with that. You can see here on that image on the right where they can blend in a seeding rate of three to 5% volume. You do need good soil contact to get your clovers to germinate. Do your homework if you're interested in looking at bee lawns and overseeding with seed mixes. We do have some good reference material in the uh, reference handout. Another idea 
really easy initial strategy is just to expand the garden, removing turf, adding mulch around trees, expanding garden beds in specific areas around perimeters and side yards where places make sense just to bring out the beds. We want to increase the plant diversity, it gives you an opportunity to plant shrubs and trees as well as perennials and ground covers. Any area that you use for a path or heavy traffic area is a good place to mulch or use hardscape material. So just expanding the garden in small ways. Now shade, boy, that's a struggle with trees and turf. This is a no brainer, but we do need to address it because you can selectively prune to increase light. You can plant more shade tolerant turf varieties like fine fescues, but you'll continue to have a problem getting turf to really establish well around the base of trees in heavy shade or even light shade. It's just a struggle. It'll always be an issue. So the ideal is to eliminate turf. This is better for your large, more mature trees. Plant shade tolerant ground covers, mulch your trees. So you're not even interfering with the root system. It's always gonna be trees versus turf. Trees will win out time and time again. What about shade where there's moss? Okay, this is the, the next opportunity to transform where you have an abundant amount of moss, usually it's in shade, low pH situations where you've got compaction and poor drainage. So if you have moss, this is where the conditions are so prevalent for that. You've got shade, you've got acid soils, soil compaction, poor drainage, and the moss is coming in. So don't fight it. Really, maybe there's opportunity to just allow it to come in and join it. Just let it come in and create moss gardens where that is possible. The conditions will always be there for the moss to win out. To cultivate moss, it loves high moisture, high humidity. So these are going to be the sites and the conditions where you're going to see it most. You want to plant any time when it's cool and moist, fall, winter, spring, when it's cool and moist is a good time. Summer is also good. It may require additional watering to keep it going. You'll have to remove grass, weeds, leaves, and debris, especially initially, if you're wanting to establish a moss area removing what's there. Even if you have an abundant amount of moss in there, you'll need to stay on top of the grass and the weeds. And then regularly removing leaves, stems, anything kind of debris that comes in from the woodland areas around you. So there is a good bit of maintenance there to maintain moss gardens. And also mosses don't like heavy traffic. So in an area where you have that, you'll have to put in stepping stones. So for pHs of 5.5, uh, which is our native soil, acid loving mosses will do best there. Mosses like nutrient poor soils. So there's really no nitrogen or phosphorus to be added. There's no additional soil amendments or anything like that, that you'll be requiring. Now there's a good bit of information out there about growing moss gardens. And if you were in Gardening in the Mountains in May, you heard Annie Martin give a talk on her moss gardening experience in Western North Carolina. This is a copy of her book where she talks about different species, how to propagate, design and install moss gardens. Also moss gardening by George Schenk, he's a biologist and goes into a good bit of detail about identifying mosses and how to get them established in the garden. So some good resources there. Finally, creating pollinator habitat. Remember we were talking about expanding some of your garden spaces, letting the weeds come in and creating bee lawns. We had a talk last year, Brian Tompkins with U.S. Fish and Wildlife 
gave this talk about creating pollinator habitat. Today, we're really talking about food resources because we're talking about the lawn. How do we bring in those food resources to attract those pollinators and create a balance there in our lawn? And for resources, we're talking about plants that have consistent flowering, different floral characteristics, including grasses, and plants for all life stages, whether they're larval plants or nectar plants. These are all things that you want to incorporate into your food plot. And these are steps of creating a food plot where you want to do a site assessment, where you prep the site, where you plant, and then you have managing it. These are the different steps, and we won't be going into that this morning because, of course, we're running way over, but just a couple of resources for you. This Xerxes Handout Habitat Assessment Guide, it helps you go through the steps of planning and installing a pollinator habitat in your yard, garden, or urban setting. And then I want to remind people of this talk that Brian Topkins did in 2021 on creating and managing pollinator habitats. That video is up on our YouTube site and available through our website, bunkamastergardener.org. He goes into very good detail about establishing larger scale pollinator plots. So if you're interested in that, he goes into the different aspects of that, especially establishing plots from seed. So I encourage you to view that video. It's very informative and full of lots of resources. In the time I have left today, I want to walk you through a case study. This is Pat McCauley's house in Weaverville. This is called the Serpentine Lawn Project by Randy Burroughs, he offered this talk for us several years ago and provided courtesy of Randy these slides for me to show you how he went in and just with Pat's work to reduce the lawn and create this serpentine area around the base of this planting. So this is before planting. Down here, you can see where they sprayed out the lawn this is their um, approach. This is in October of 2017, where they went in and sprayed out the lawn to initially establish the bed. And you can see where they created this design by just expanding this planting that's at the base of the house. This is a winter shot showing where after the grass had been killed out, they mulched it. So again, you can see a good contrast there. In May, they came in with plugs and gallon plants. This is on planting day. This is mid-May of 2018. These are two and a half to three inch pots. They purchased them or grew them in a tray of 32. They kept them watered. And then of course, during planting, as you'll see, you want to make sure they stay rooted. But this is a way you can go even with small pots or gallons. They went in and planted them. Randy, of course, created this design where you can see it was a combination of grasses, gallon plots, and small perennial starts where they came in and just laid them out. You can see why it's important to be efficient because these roots, many of them are exposed and you want to make sure they're wet and ready to go. So here they are laying them out and starting to plant and working their way over on the foreground. They've planted them at some close spacing because they wanted a good quick fill in and working their way around. This is in July after planting. You can see beyond the verbena bonariensis there, you can see the plants starting to get established and then even beginning to grow. There's a small Asclepius milkweed there at the base starting to grow. This was planted in May. This is a July 6th photo. You can see the Asclepius, the coneflower, and the grasses really filling in there. So you can see this is just a simple first step of getting a start on expanding the garden, reducing the lawn, creating pollinator habitat, giving you some ideas on what's reachable and doable 
in a very small, simple way. So it's a love-hate relationship, right? In summary, we know that turf has a purpose and it adds definitely value to our environment and our habitat and our gardens. We know that there's a lot of maintenance required and inputs required, depending on where you are in the bell curve of perfect lawn. There's a lot of environmental cost to maintaining that perfect lawn. We know that sometimes it's just going to look bad and it might look bad to others, whereas to us, it could look really good. We've learned that there's ways of changing some of our management practices to transform the turf, to make it more environmental friendly by expanding the garden, replacing turf with mulches, ground covers, and pollinator friendly plantings. Tomorrow is going to be Earth Day, April 22nd. Here's a good time to make some changes. Think about letting some or all of the lawn go a little more wild, providing for pollinators, maybe changing and adjusting some of our practices of mowing and spraying, maybe even going towards more battery operated equipment. So we're reducing the fuel and emissions output. Maybe you've seen some of the advertisement and promotion that the Xerxes and B-City USA is making about no mow May. This is a promotion to encourage people not to mow during the month of May. And I would see if you say starting now, because this is when a lot of those early perennials and annual flowering plants are out there for those early pollinators. They need this early food to help them get started in a good way. I want to thank you for attending a couple of other items. We do have online education and education in the garden. We will have Wednesdays in the learning garden here at our office at 49 Mount Carmel Road and Saturday seminars are available throughout the growing season. We have all of this information available at bunkermastergardener.org. Now, if you need help with your plant problems, call the garden helpline or email us at bunkermg at gmail.com. We always can help you with your plant problems. If you can help us with the plant name and what you're dealing with, what are the signs and symptoms, we will be asking you a lot of questions. You can also send us some good photos. You want to include photos of the good and the bad parts, what's healthy, give us some scale. It needs to be in focus, close up and a whole plant, the more, the better. We want to help you with your gardening problems, but also help you be good gardeners here in Buncombe County and Western North Carolina. Happy Earth Day, everybody. I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning and for hanging in there with us. Thank you so much.